regular evening meeting. Um, first item on the agenda is the adoption and the receipt of agenda items of the regular evening meeting council. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Davis. Um, call, I guess I call the question. All those in favor? Carries unanimously. Um, second thing on the agenda is uh, the adoption of the minutes of the regular evening meeting for January 13. Do I have a motion? Councillor Davis, Councillor Ferguson, any errors or omissions? Councillor Richter. Um, yes, with regards to the two delegations uh, last week, um, the delegation from Mr. Sign, where Council got follow-up feedback from his strata council that they do not agree with his position and his delegation. I'm wondering if he's aware of that. And um, also if uh, there's any update on the Greg Sadowski delegation over the Milner Height trees. Right. Uh, uh, correct, correct you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we're not certain of, these aren't really not minute items, they're update items, but just to dispose of them, the sign matter, we're not certain what the Strata Council communicated to Mr. Sign, we would suspect he did, and the Sadowski matter is still a work in progress. Yeah, but I, I was just, that one I was particularly concerned about, um, because I'm sure we're getting a report back from Council, but he should be aware that his position, I don't think, is supported by his Strata Council. Okay, so um, all those in favor, call the question. Opposed? Carries. So, um, oh, I guess we got to do the uh, public hearing meeting. Uh, Move receipt. The adoption okay. of the minutes for adoption. the public hearing. Uh, Councillor Long seconded by Councillor Davis. Any errors or omissions? All those in favor? Opposed? I'm in favor. Okay, it's unanimous. Okay, so moving on to, we don't have any presentations, so um, delegations. Um, so we have Jeff Baker from the Willoughby uh, Residents Association. Um, welcome, and you have five minutes, but if you could please state your name and uh, where you live. Sure, good evening. Record. Good evening, uh, Jeff Baker, 83A Avenue in Yorks and North in Willoughby. Good evening, Council. Um, pleasure to be back again um, to present the survey results from the WRA Community Survey of 2019. At about four minutes and 30 seconds, I'll be waving at you just to let you know. All right, so. We all know what Willoughby is, and we're happy to live there, and we're happy that uh, there's a good representation in the Willoughby Residents Association. So we're a nonprofit, nonpart, nonpolitical organization that is working to address or to um, to advocate for the residents in Willoughby in t in the township of Langley. Um, we're just a group of of interest community residents, and we just want to make sure that we have a great community and that we're well represented in the township. Membership currently stands at 38 paid members, um, with an additional 147 residents subscribing to our e-updates that are sent out on a regular and semi-regular basis. And we're very active on social media, including Facebook, with a reach of over 4,500 impressions for posts every week. And as mentioned, we're nonprofit, nonpartisan, so we really don't uh, care for anything except the community. That's our that's our standpoint. Our activities in the last year. We um, presented the All Candidates meeting October 3, 2019 for the federal general election. Willoughby Days at the Willoughby Town Centre, very well attended at our booth. Quarterly residence meetings, um, February, May, September and November. And our annual general meeting that we had just this past November. We also conducted our second annual community survey in July and August of 2019, which I'm here to speak with you, to you tonight, or tonight about. It was our second annual survey following the success of the inaugural in 2018. Survey was built in-house and it helps us learn about what our community's makeup is, the employment side, recreation patterns, and specific areas of concern and interest for the, for the residents. It was distributed in July and August of 19 through our website, through social media, direct email, and in hard copy of the booth at Willoughby Days, as well as at local seniors communities to get more um, age or age representation. 308 respondents representing about 1% of Willoughby's total population and represents about 10% of Willoughby voters uh, who participated in the 2018 municipal election at the Willoughby polling stations. I'm just going to focus on the um, key points here. 
Top community concerns identified through the survey, road design and infrastructure, crime, traffic, safety, speed, calming and enforcement, and of course, high density development. The priorities identified out of those top, top concerns. Infrastructure was a top priority. Road infrastructure was frequently mentioned, especially the widening of arterials, uh, something of which um, you folks have heard a lot about and I know you are addressing um, or looking at again, uh, thanks to the work of, uh, of council and staff. However, many residents also mentioned property building out the collector and neighborhood roads to help drive a sense of connectivity in the community. Um, it's fine for 208, it's fine for 200, but if you can't get from one development to another, it, it really impedes the sense of community in Willoughby. There's also very closely intertwined concerns with traffic and congestion, especially for the north-south connectivity, but also um, infrastructure for walkability and non-motorized transport. Um, it's one thing to get cars, but it's another thing if I live 500 meters away from a grocery store and I can't walk to it because there's no sidewalks. I can't bike to it because there's no bike lanes. Um, residents all um, expressed a lot of frustration with those sidewalks not being present or they're built in such a piecemeal manner that they serve no purpose. Um, there's also frequent commenting about infrastructure not being friendly to all community members, particularly the youngest and the oldest, those with disabilities, and even those middle of, uh, middle of the road community members. Um, just the simple things like big buttons on intersections. That says cars take priority over the people. Enforcement was a uh, most frequently mentioned priority. And um, many respondents mentioned um, that they want to see more police presence. Um, they're feeling unsafe because of property crimes. And we are encouraging residents to, const to uh, report every, um, every incident to our CMP um, to help drive their evidence-based or data-based decision making. In enforcement, there was um, a lot about traffic enforcement saying there's a lot of cars and a lot of them going very fast and there, it makes for a very unwalkable community, um, not very friendly to people or non-motorized transport speeding, not stopping at red lights, not stopping at stop signs, um, motorists using sidewalks and bicycle lanes as additional traffic lanes for whatever reason. And lastly, enforcement um, res respondents expressed concern that existing bylaws, especially parking and secondary suites, are not being enforced by the township. Um, it's that if, and if complaints are made, they're not being acted on in a timely, effective manner, and that it seems like breaching township bylaws has no repercussions that the complaints lead to no action or changes. We asked what solutions residents were proposing. They want to see more police. Um, and we are, as I said, encouraging reporting of, um, of criminal activity and even suspected criminal activity. In second place, again, was widen arterial roads, um, which, uh, which I don't need to go in any further. Um, but also, again, increased enforcement for bylaws. That is the major. Yeah, the 30 seconds. 30 seconds, great. Uh, just into the walkability, um, the four major intersections that people identified for challenges accessing schools, um, those were 45% of the total respondents, 55% were non, um, they were all others. But interestingly, the ones that people are really concerned about are intersections that already have traffic signals and pedestrian crossings. And also the current primary method of getting around town private vehicle gasoline powered, it's almost 85% of, of uh, residents. But what do they wanna see? They wanna see walking, they wanna see biking, and they wanna see transit. So those are the primary concerns. If you have any questions, I'm happy to meet with uh, any councillors or uh, anyone, staff at any time. Please um, don't hesitate to uh, keep interested in the WRA and uh, we look forward to working with you in the coming year. Okay, Thank you. don't leave yet. We do have a couple questions. So Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Baker, for coming tonight. I certainly read through your report and survey. It's, it's great, and we spent a lot of time and effort in that. Um, of course, we all know that uh, roads certainly are important and connectivity. That's something we're aware of. I did want to just ask you a quick question. I know others might, and we have a meeting as well. Is crime and all certainly uh, traffic enforcement and bylaw enforcement. Any particular bylaws? Is parking bylaws, or is there something in particular that, that you're not getting through, if I may? I, I, from what the respondents have said, it's the secondary suites. There's a lot of illegal suites, unauthorized suites, and that then contributes into the parking issues that are seen in the community. So I think if you're, if there's an enforcement in um, the the secondary suite side, you may be addressing the parking side, or vice versa. It made six of one, half a dozen the other. I think. And the, and the last thing, crime in general. Mm -hmm. I noticed that. I was I was surprised to see that, but although it seems to be generating in, in cycles. Yeah, I think it's uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, concern that um, just sort of I guess lower level property crime, um, and I think there's a real perception that Langley be, be seen as a dumping ground for criminal activity happening on other sides in municipalities, which I shall not name. 
Very good. Thank you very much. For <laughs> thank you, Councillor. All right. Thanks for, for coming. There's no other questions. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, no reports to council, so we'll move on to bylaws for first and second reading. Um, let me just pull that up here. So F1, rezoning application number 100573 and development permit application numbers. So moved. <laughs> 100. 094 and 101095, John de Grip Holdings Incorporated, 3100 272nd Street, bylaw number 5550. Moved by Councillor Woodward, seconded by. Oh, Councillor Long, okay. All right, so any discussion? Councillor Richter. Yeah, I just had a question, maybe through you to staff. There seems to be an awful lot of very positive excitement. Uh, in Aldergrove about seeing this uh, particular application move forward, so I certainly support sending it to public hearing. I think there's been um, at least a couple of very detailed um, open houses that have generated a lot of good feedback. But I did receive a question last week, and maybe Mr. Safi can answer it for me. Someone actually called me and asked me how soon could they buy these units. And... <laughs> Like, that's how much excitement there is about this. And I didn't really know the answer. I think she was thinking, well, can she buy one this year? So I was wondering if, if maybe Mr. Safi could give us a realistic um, idea of how long it will take to go through the process now with first and second through to final approval and groundbreaking and buildings being available for sale. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the question. It is a very difficult one, challenging one to st for staff to respond to because of the <clears throat> many different factors, uh, as Council Richter is aware, including public hearing and what, what we may hear from the public, what Council may hear, and, and the various, uh, I guess, directions that the, the input may take us uh, collectively, as well as how quickly and how... I guess aggressively, the proponents might might wish to respond and, and address the conditions imposed by council as part of the rezoning process, and then subsequently, uh, in terms of uh, I guess meeting the market needs. Uh, so, uh, a, a typical application uh, we generally tell proponents uh, as rezoning application is about a 12, 12, 12 to 18 month process uh, uh, on average. Uh, they could be on the low end 12 months, and they could be on the high end 18 months. In this case, because of the the, uh, the pre-work, if you will, all the, the heavy loading has, or a lot of it, has been already uh, accomplished and achieved. So we expect, I guess, the, uh, the uh, following public hearing, and assuming council wishes to grant their reading, uh, final adoption is achievable within uh, a matter of months, two or three months. As opposed to as opposed to longer than that, as far as when they can proceed to uh, market and actually have have units available for sale, I don't know. Uh, typically, that's something that uh, they do after a third reading has been granted uh, because of the legal uh, requirements. Thank you, Councillor Arneson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, like many other members on council, I'm sure we're overjoyed that this has come forward. It's a very exciting and innovative proposal. Um, I did have some questions. I'm happy to put this forward um, to the community for public feedback. I did have a question, though, regarding the parkade aspect of it, because I'm hoping that prior to uh, consideration at that time, we can have some more details, if there are any, having to do with um, any representations or, oh, that's a good description or diagram. Um, so it's very good graphic to indicate what's being considered as an amenity on the site. The only thing is that I'm not aware of all the details, if there are any, to consider as to how that's going to be managed. So I understand from the staff report that the township uh, will negotiate, if this is supported, that it will receive the air rights to be able to put this structure on the property. 
So that makes sense, but I don't have any idea about the running of the structure itself, its maintenance, its upkeep, its total cost. Is it going to be pay parking? So all of these things, I think, um, I don't think that this is a critical component at this time, but I would like further details because it will help me to uh, understand a lot of the other uh, integral components on the site and um, I'm hopeful that uh, staff will actually be able to provide through the proponents some further details. Councillor Whitmarsh. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a, uh, a couple of um, questions um, with it. Um, the residential, uh, on building D, uh, this is the building here that's in front of us with the uh, parkade, uh, four-story parkade. Now, what... what is there I'm assuming there's residential parking on top of the in addition to the 188 stalls in the four floors is that is that correct uh, through through the chair to staff uh, that is correct uh, madam chair through you to to councillor Whitmarsh there is a level of on the ground parking that will address the needs of the development that pretty much encompasses the entire site. So it's shared parking on one level uh, with the needs of the residents, both in uh, buildings A, which is where the cursor is now, and, and building B, which is this one to the north, as well as building D uh, being provided. So there is no reliance, there is no need to meet the bylaw requirements for parking as far as this building con is concerned. So uh, whatever, uh, I guess, uh, provisions are being made as part of the, uh, the parkade structure of in building D, those are in addition to the, the zoning model requirements and therefore for public benefit as opposed to the development benefit. Okay, so is that, is that um, did I hear you say that it's underground parking under the whole area of phase one? That's correct. It actually uh, goes a little bit further because it just makes sense for them to construct all of the, the underground parking at the same time. So it, it, it may not be just for phase one, but it's, it's providing uh, for future phases as well, potentially. And there's also some surface parking as well. Okay, so the, the 188 stalls in the four floors uh, that we're talking about, a uh, public parkade, uh, that would be reserved for the public and not available to residents of these buildings? Uh, well, that's a different question, uh, Madam Chair, through you to Councillor Whitmarsh. Uh, I suppose it goes back to the question raised by Councillor Arneson in terms of how we, uh, the Township of Langley, decides how Council directs staff to proceed with respect to uh, the construction, the funding, and the maintenance, operation and maintenance of Building D. Uh, what I was referring to was meeting the requirements. Uh, what I said was they don't have a reliance on Building D. Now, it doesn't mean that they cannot park there. That would take another step, another, I guess, action to prohibit residents from parking there and making it exclusively for the benefit of the public. But that is not uh, part of the discussion. It has not been part of the discussion so far because a fundamental question is whether council agrees with, with the funding uh, strategy. Right, okay. So, yeah, that's helpful um, information. It's something that we'll certainly have to uh, consider. Um, one of the, the costs, uh, and it doesn't really talk about it so much in here, at least if it did, I kind of missed it, but the cost to the township for those four floors of parking. Um, and, and we've had numbers that we've, you know, I've heard, but it's not, I don't think it's in here. If it is, please correct me. But the, um, ha, ha, how, how do we determine that this four floors of 188 stalls is the right number? Like why, for example, wouldn't we have two floors with 95 stalls or whatever it is? Why, why this four floors? What, what, sort of leads us to believe that that's the correct number of floors and stalls for us in a publicly owned parkade? Uh, Madam Chair, the, I guess, configuration of Building D is not something that staff had a, any input on in terms of uh, the four levels of parking and, and, and six levels of uh, residential. 
that was something that presumably went into the the, 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 the proponents pro forma uh, to ensure there is, uh, I guess, uh, adequate uh, attention to uh, the, the, the economics of the project and, and making sure it's viable and at the same time providing an amenity for, for the community. Right, okay, so that feels to me like if, if the township's going to be paying for those that parkade, it would seem to make sense that we would do our own assessment if that's what we think is important or necessary or whatever that is at some point. Um, just the last point on this parkade, um, on page 15 um, in our package, the very last uh, paragraph uh, says that um, the applicant indicates that the parking structure is proposed to be ultimately owned and operated by the Township of Langley, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, with the developer's con con uh, contributed proposed contribution of land in the form of an airspace parcel. So I'm assuming that's, um, they are committing land and we're, we're not really purchasing land, we're purchasing the space above the land. Is that what's meant by airspace parcel? That is correct. Okay, thank you. And then it goes on um, in here and it says, if support and application for subdivision, the airspace parcel will be required, which makes sense. Um, but then it says, the next sentence, if this does not receive support, the parking structure, from council, then development of building D will be postponed to phase two of the development. So this seems to imply that um, one option is to have the township own the four uh, level parkade. Uh, a second option would be for the township not to have a four level parkade and instead um, let building D move to a second phase, and I guess by way this is reading, maybe owned by somebody else. Am, am I reading that correctly in, in the package, that one option is we own it, the other option is to just delay building D and it'll just go up later on in a, in a second phase? Uh, sort of. Uh, I, I need to clarify that, uh, Madam Chair, through you to Councillor Whitmarsh, uh, it may or may not happen, and if it does happen, it may or may not be exactly as you see now. That is our understanding of, of the proponent's rationale. That section that you see at the bottom of the one that you referenced, Councillor Whitmarsh, at the uh, bottom of page 15, is actually uh, partially uh, taken directly from the propor proponent's rationale, which is provided as attachment E to the, the staff report. So staff's understanding is that if there is no uh, appetite, if you will, by council to contribute towards the construction of building D in relation with the parking uh, structure, then the proponent is not in a position financially to provide that at this stage and will defer that to a future phase and may, not, may or may not offer that as a, a, a public amenity. And it may require reconfiguration and in fact it will require for sure another development permit because it will no longer be at that that location unless it's exactly as shown exactly at that location just uh, being constructed at a different future date right okay um yeah that's helpful to understand so yeah so based on the way i'm reading it it it's uh, i can understand how it would be different and could be uh, in a different location it might not involve the township it might we don't know but it does seem to indicate that phase one um, could still continue except that it might be a three building phase one as opposed to a four building phase one is the way that i'm reading it um, one other question uh, then and i'll move on to other people um, i think in uh, just find it here uh, page 19 it talks about uh, bike lanes being proposed for the aldergrove town center drive um, I'm wondering if those bike lanes are uh, like separated uh, bike lanes, separated from the main road uh, with some kind of, whether it's a small curb or something that uh, would protect them from the cars that go through on that road. Just through, through, your, through your worship staff. Separated, yes, but uh, I think Councillor Whitmarsh's question might be, Madam Chair, to phys is there a physical separation between them in terms of a barrier of some kind? I don't believe that's the case. There will be a space set aside for a separate bike lane so they're not sharing the pavement, if you will, the roadway with vehicular traffic, except for, I guess, at intersections, uh, but there won't be a physical barrier between, between the two modes. 
Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I've expressed, I think, here today uh, concerns that I have. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for it to go to, to, uh, to the public hearing, um, but I certainly do have some concerns, and I certainly want to hear from the public about those things as well. So thank you. Councillor Long. <clears throat> Thanks. There's been a lot of discussion already. I, I think I got the same phone call, uh, Councillor Richter. I'm not sure why they're phoning me or you, um, but I did refer them to my daughter-in-law, who's a uh, realtor. No, I didn't. Um, but it was an interesting question that came, and I think that the, even though some answers have been given by staff, it's all going to depend on what council does and what the public does. Uh, I don't believe that they can be marketing anything or selling any units until they at least receive third reading, as been said, or even maybe fourth reading. So I guess this is really finally in the hands of council. I know many people think that uh, council's had a hand to play in this for the last 30 years, but this is the first time that council really has a hand to play, and it's going to depend on what happens at the public hearing. And being such a complex um, application, which it is, extremely complex, I just hope that, uh, that staff will give a really good presentation or a good uh, description of it before the public hearing starts so that we can get uh, you know, the grounds, not ground rules, but the, the basic uh, explanation given, especially in terms of parking. Because I think what I've heard just in the last little while then is building B and building A don't have parking below? And maybe that's the question I'd like to ask. Is there not underground parking in A and B? There is. There is, yeah. yes. Yeah. As well as the, the, two, to the two levels underneath building D. And I think there was another question asked about uh, residents being parking in the, in the public parkade. Well, it's a public parkade, so I'm sure they could be. But uh, the reverse wouldn't be allowed, from my understanding, that the two levels underground, which are for the residents of the building and, the, and perhaps employees, wouldn't be open to the public. So there's that about it. Um, and then I, there was a question asked, and I would like the answer to this too, is who did determine, how was it determined, how many parking spots were appropriate? And uh, my understanding that there would have been a traffic study of some kind, and maybe it's attached here, there's an awful lot of information, but maybe staff can confirm that that is the case, and which attachment should we be uh, looking at for that one? Uh, Madam Chair, what I said earlier was that there, <coughs> the parking that's being provided in Building D, there is no rationalization for it provided. The parking that's provided underground and on surface meets our zoning model requirements. The staff is not aware of what uh, prompted the applicant other than, I guess, conjecture in terms of uh, economics and financial viability as to the rationalization behind four stories of, of parking structure and six stories of residential. And that's a fair comment. But, I mean, uh, it's quite obvious to me from these pictures uh, that this is going to be an extremely unique building. In, in fact, it will be quite distinctive in the Fraser Valley. I, I don't know if there is anything like it where you've got uh, four stories of concrete and then six stories above. And I imagine in order to, to accomplish that, even though we're getting closer to wood construction, this would have to be uh, metal to construction of some kind to allow that building code. Is that the question? Uh, buildings A and B are... Uh uh, enabled uh, or, or allowed to, to be constructed of, of wood, uh, building D, not at this point. It must be uh, uh, other forms of construction, steel and, and concrete. Uh, having said that, as Council uh, may recall, we have requested to be part of the uh, early approval uh, package for uh, up to 12 stories of, of wood, which the province is now allowing. Yeah, but I don't know if this would be in time for that. If, if it actually proceeded as phase one, it most likely would be proceeding with metal, I would think. But however, we'll see, I suppose. So the public hearing, would, would uh, if this passes, would be in a couple of weeks. I don't see any other items for first and second on the, uh, on the agenda. So will this be primarily uh, a special public hearing for this application only, or do the staff plan to put a few others in, because it could be a long night if that happened? Can we make this dedicated to this one application? Is that the plan? Currently, there aren't any applications for first and second reading, as uh, Councillor uh, Long has, uh, has referenced, uh, Madam Chair, so this will be the only item on the agenda. Uh, staff does wish to note that there are more than one recommendations for Council to consider, in particular uh, the referral of 
the request of the applicant uh, in terms of the uh, funding for the parkade to the 2021 budget process. It's going to be an interesting evening. Thank you very much. Councillor Davis. Got lots said. Um, <coughs> let's get it to a public hearing and hear what the public have to say. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Well, yes, it's a kind of exciting project here. Uh, many of us on council and perhaps the uh, in the audience have, uh, believe it or not, used to shop in the Alder Grove Mall. <laughs> and uh, it was always a disappointment when the um, mall did uh, decide not to continue on in their uh, retail. And uh, it sat for, as we all know, a number of years. Now, again, if I mentioned it's exciting, it's exciting to see that um, this applicant has come together and um, has put together, and we've been asking them for a long time as well as uh, others uh, to proceed with something, and now we've uh, called it a fast track or asked staff to help out to move the system along and adding uh, three phases. Now, I have, one qu I have a couple of quick questions. My first question is in the phase one, two, and three, they don't have, if I may, through the chair, they don't have any real timelines for anything other than phase one, if I may, through the chair? Uh, that's correct. So that's, a, and, and, and having said that, a lot of discussion has been to date about, and we've got uh, correspondence and, and perhaps other methods of uh, uh, communication with the public regarding the, um, I guess it's a parking uh, facility the, the parking requirements for that the ten story mixed use building with the uh, parkade and residential um, we need to uh, listen to what the public has to say and also uh, work with the proponent to make this uh, phase one complete as best we possibly can and uh, I'm not making any suggestions of what we should do right now but the most important thing is to look at this exciting application. Uh, listen to the, what the public and uh, we'll make a decision accordingly at third reading. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Woodward. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm certainly happy to see this here at the council table, um, eagerly anticipating its arrival for for some time. So I obviously support it going to public hearing as it is, and I'm glad to hear that uh, the rest of the council does as well. And I take those comments about... Uh, some concerns and some some outstanding questions still to be answered. That's why I look forward to having the proponent here. I think hopefully he can answer some of those. Um, but I did want to ask a, a legal procedural question to staff, if I may, Madam Chair, to Mr. Backen. Uh, some of the rules around public hearings and submissions. So I just want to clarify what a deadline for me might be to get a memo to council submitted. So if the public hearing is on the 10th, is the is a submission from another member of council to the rest of council have to be submitted by the 10th? If it's introducing information that may not have been included in the public hearing, yes, it ought to be. If it's actually simply the council communicating about the information they received or heard through the public hearing process, then that can be part of the subsequent discussions and need not be disseminated prior to the close of the public hearing. Might be some gray area there. So if, if I wanted to say, for example, uh, outline some potential funding options, would those have to be submitted by the 10th? Uh, generally, because the topic matter, that being of funding, is contained in the public hearing and in the item referred to on page uh, 3 of the agenda, uh, the general topic of finance and funding is covered. So if it's actually exploring those within the context of the uh, processes we ordinarily have, no, that's part of the subsequent discussion. If it was to be something, say, outside of this unconventional funding, uh, a lottery, which is which is not applicable, then that would have to be undertaken prior to the close of the public hearing. Okay, so I might talk more a little bit with you um, outside of the council meeting to clarify that any submission that I that I may or may not make in a written form would have a, a deadline attached to that, similar to members of the public. Uh, I wanted to clarify also with, uh, with Mr. Seffi one of his comments regarding no rationale provided for the parking structure. And I want to get to drill down on what the definition of rationale might be. Um, is it not a requirement uh, that the proponent would have provided a traffic impact study to get to this point? Uh, there may have been, but there is also additional requirements for additional parking studies to be done. So there would have been a, uh, I guess, a more 
uh, generic, if you will, a, a more high-level analysis that would have been done to inform the, uh, uh, the locations of the buildings, the access and egress issues, but there's more specifics to be uh, resolved, and that's why there's a need for another uh, uh, traffic impact study that staff is identifying in the prerequisites. Okay, so my next question following up on that. So in the Alder Grove core plan here, which I have here, uh, 3.2.28, a parking strategy for the downtown should be undertaken to determine off-street and on-street parking requirements. Um, and then there was another reference in another portion about uh, regarding a central parking structure. Has the proponent submitted a study related to potential rationale for the shared parking structure? The minimal one? Some limited information at this time. Is it possible to have that distributed to council? Or is that premature? Certainly, we can provide that to okay, council. So I'd like to know if, they, if, even if it's preliminary or of a minor nature, I would still like to see that. That would probably help inform all of the discussion if the proponent has, in fact, uh, submitted some rash, potentially uh, something that might be considered rationale by by others. Um, so I want to reiterate again that uh, I certainly support it. Um, the history of Building D, I think I want to learn a little bit more about that as well at the public hearing. So I look forward to the proponent coming forward. The structure that I see is uh, somebody pretty committed to <coughs> fulfilling the uh, some key components of the Alder Grove core plan. Uh, one of the only proponents I know of with enough real estate to even potentially do that as integrated as part of a development versus what White Rock has done, which is purchase a lot and put a brick of concrete on top of it in the middle of their walkable district. This is an option, an opportunity to fulfill a key component of the Alder Grove core plan uh, within an integrated development with no land cost to the taxpayer, potentially with a funding source that was magically arranged about six months ago. So, and I want to remind council on uh, the Alder Grove core plan, um, Section 3.2.19, encourage shared parking between projects where it can be justified, where it does not generate negative impacts. 3.222, encourage shared parking facilities where parking demand varies over the course of day for different activities and land uses. 3.2.23, promote alternatives to surface parking, such as a central shared structure for non-residential parking. 3.2.24, consider central parking structures where proven feasible and appropriate. So I think we have a proponent who, uh, who told me that he was part of the process to create the Alder Grove Core Plan and is doing his bit and giving us a chance to do ours to move it forward. And so I think with this application and what council does with it, we're going to find out whether the Alder Grove Core Plan is worth the paper it's printed on. Thank you. Councillor Richter. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on a point that Councillor Long uh, raised, and I, I definitely agree with him. I think this will be a very busy public hearing and should probably just have the one dedicated topic. The issue that I have is if the public hearing is going to occur on February 10th, Council passed a motion, I believe, earlier this afternoon to have a budget session on the 10th starting at 1030. Um, I think we need to move the budget session. Otherwise, it'll be a horrendously long day for us. And we might also need to plan for a second night of hearings. Can we move the budget session or can we move the public hearing? Um, I think both are becoming priorities. So I think it's a very good point and something we should probably discuss on the third. We're committed to the public hearing as of the procedure set forth tonight. Uh, the third that we'd have time to look at the revamped budget timeline uh, and have a bit more of a, a leisurely uh, review but to make sure it works for everyone. Okay. So we're going to revisit it on the, the third? That's correct and the implications to the budget and the priorities and the impact of those things. Um, so I okay. think that's something we should Well, I'm, uh, I'm really not in favor of having a budget session starting at 1030 and then still be sitting in a public hearing by 11 o'clock at night. I think one or the other, not both. So I'll, re I'll be happy to raise that on the third. Thanks. Councillor Whitmarsh. Yeah, just a <clears throat> quicker question uh, that I forgot to ask earlier. Um, 
He talks in here about transit and, and this becoming a, a, a central sort of transit plaza area and describes there as being a transit plan, plaza that will be created. Uh, I'm wondering what that means when we talk about a transit plaza. I'm, I'm envisioning that, um, you know, Alder Grove sort of being, at least in Metro Vancouver, I guess is pretty close to the end of the line, and it's a pretty central place. Uh, it already talks in our package about a number of different bus routes coming together and the, and the plan to have even more uh, bus routes coming through Alder Grove. So I'm wondering if um, just uh, through the chair uh, to staff, if you could just maybe explain a little bit some of the thinking around what is a transit plaza, what does that look like, how does this accommodate the, all the different buses that might be coming there? Madam Chair, can I respond? Yeah. Sorry, yes. Uh, so I guess several, several things come to mind. One is the plans that we gen generate, with, that, that, that we develop with public input uh, and then council adopts. They're fairly long-term long visionary documents. So uh, the intent is for this, this, uh, this plan to uh, withstand the test of time, if you will, and, and evolve and develop over, over decades, not, not years. So having said that, uh, there is a vision because Alder Grove actually is one of our two. We only have two. We have a, 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 a third one at a higher level in terms of the hierarchy, hierarchy of, uh, of centers in the regional plan. We do have uh, the, t the municipal uh, the regional town center in Willowbrook, and then we have two other municipal town centers, one in Willoughby at uh, 80th and 208th, and the other one in Aldergrove. So that, I guess, gives the area another level of, uh, I guess, support in terms of transit uh, service being provided at a future date. So that is, has been the vision, will remain to be the vision for us. Uh, having said that, we have been discussing and we have been uh, successful in, in uh, making sure that TransLink provides uh, better uh, bus service to other Grove. That's part of it. So with that in mind, uh, there is attention as part of this application is concerned uh, for locating the, the bus stops. And uh, it may be, I guess, news to a lot of people, uh, but we have received discussions or have received inquiries from our neighbor to the east in terms of uh, whether we would be interested in, in uh, discussing their approach to the province and, and their regional district with respect to working with our regional district uh, for extension of a rapid... Uh, uh, transit of, of a higher, I guess, uh, scale or nature, such as a SkyTrain, uh, given the fact that SkyTrain in the, in the uh, current uh, Mayor's Council on TransLink, uh, as part of their 10-year vision, is expected to extend to the uh, Langley uh, area. Uh, our friends to the east, Abbotsford uh, staff, have been asking us if, if we've had any discussions or if we're interested in having discussions to extend that all the way along Fraser Highway to, uh, to Abbotsford. So if that was to happen, again, not in the next 10 years, uh, then certainly this is something that, that uh, plans of this nature in terms of a development plan need to keep in mind and accommodate for. Right, so, okay, so the, the, the plans for this particular application would be to include the concept of expansion for public transit, which is, would be buses, but also possible uh, SkyTrain or whatever that might be, uh, to this area. So the plans are, are, are going to be accommodating that and considering that as we move forward. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Yeah, I just wanted to... Um ask for one more question too if we can uh, get as part of this leading up to the public hearing uh, just another question through to staff mr sevi if we can clarify directly with the proponents uh, and or their uh, consultant team uh, regarding the claims in the staff report about the delay of building d so uh, i was a bit surprised to read that and then i did clarify with uh, with the senior staff so i appreciate that clarification um where that came from and that was in their rationale letter but that was written approximately six months ago uh, and included in the staff report so um, I actually just called the proponent on Friday and I asked him um, will you 
be delaying building D if the parkade is taken out? Um, and the answer was uh, yes, as long as, as for as quickly as I can get an amended building per, a development permit resubmitted without it uh, and proceed uh, with this item taken out. So this isn't a, this, I, I would like to get that confirmed in writing for council, if that's possible, Mr. Sefi, for the public hearing. That's can be distributed to us in prior to, to make it very clear what the proponent's current position is as opposed to what their position may have been six months ago. Uh, and I, I would like to get that, that clarified. Thanks. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, certainly we can get a more up-to-date uh, response or, or position clarification from the prop proponent, but uh, the staff report, as I said earlier, does reference a rationale that was provided by the architect acting on behalf of the, uh, the owner that is dated January 14th, so it wasn't from uh, from many many months ago. It's actually only a couple of weeks old. And as I said earlier, it was a direct uh, quote that we took uh, from that rationale, attachment F, uh, which starts on page 287. Uh, so there are sections on uh, the third page of that document that reference what staff has referenced in uh, the staff report. Okay, so I appreciate but we can you. get a, a more up-to-date one. That'd be great. Okay, so I definitely appreciate you clarifying my factual error there. My notes are incorrect, so I just simply uh, transcribed that date incorrectly. So I appreciate that clarification. Um, so there may be some, uh, regarding the economics of this or future plans, there may be some miscommunication or updates to occur between the proponent and uh, the consultant team in specifics of this unique aspect. So if we can have that double-checked and triple-checked and distributed to council, I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, so seeing no other questions, I'll call the question on F1. It carries unanimously. Moving on to bylaws for first, second, and third reading. We have a motion, please. For, okay. for G1, yeah, sorry. I should. Development cost charges bylaw number 5555. Uh, moved by Councillor Whitmarch, seconded by Councillor Davis. Any discussion? Councillor Richter? Uh, yes. I have a question um, to staff. Is there an appeal mechanism? Uh, we can apply for in this situation. Uh, it just seems very high-handed that they'd reject a bunch of projects that should be eligible for DCCs. Madam Chair, we have uh, made inquiries, uh, including discussions with legal counsel, and there aren't any formal appeal processes anticipated or, or provided for in the legislation. Having said that, as the, uh, the staff report references, there are, I guess, informal appeal processes that are available to us, and staff does recommend proceeding with those at all levels. Uh, the step that staff is recommending in terms of an amended DCC program bylaw uh, that's in front of council is uh, a measure to make sure that our rates reflect current construction costs and, and land values and it does not preclude us from proceeding on those appeal processes, even though informal they are. Thank you. Councillor uh, Woodward. Yeah, so I'm, not, I'm gonna just accept the, accept the situation, which may be a little unfair, Mr. Bracken. I'm gonna ask a couple questions, if I may, Madam Chair. The, you know, we have capital projects removed, so we're decreasing the DCC burden onto development within this particular bylaw, but this will be an issue that will be revisited this year? Uh, that would be our hope. It depends very much on how our discussions go with the other levels of government as to this anomaly that's developed. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, the province and, and we're going to work together to try to find out how, these, how our contributions are going to be made outside of the DCC program, if at all. So I look forward to learning a bit more about that, but not belaboring that too much more. I have a possible amendment, uh, Madam Chair, but I might allow others to speak if that's what you would prefer. Sure. To let you know that I, I do have an amendment to okay. uh, make one small change. I'll come back to you then. Okay. Councillor Arneson. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I have no remedy for this problem, but I uh, just want to bemoan the fact that we are a creature of the province, and I'm very unfortunate from my perspective that um, there has been this new interpretation, apparently, of even projects that we've been allowed to um, create draft budgets for. And so I know that the staff report goes into the details of advocacy and working with the province, and I look forward to hearing what Councillor Woodward is going to put forward as a potential amendment. Um, but I'm wondering whether or not there might be an opportunity for some more advocacy through other governments that are seriously affected by this, similar to our situation. Um, because at the very least, I, I just look at it as a general principle and say that I think that in any case where we would have been pre-considered and approved for this kind of funding, that we should be grandfathered. Because I don't think we should be in a situation where we have more or less banked on or considered that we are going to be in a financial position that now the government, a senior level of government, is taking a different position. So even if there isn't any uh, formal mechanism for um, any kind of appeal or review of that decision, I really look forward to having further robust discussions and finding uh, a meaningful and substantive remedy for this problem because it is quite a serious problem. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, I don't want to repeat, if I may, the statements made by my colleagues. This is certainly disappointed. If I may, just a real quick question through the chair. Has this happened many times in the past that I can't recall any, if I may? Councillor, or Mr. Sevy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It has never happened in the past. This is our, our first experience with this. So that's why I just wanted to comment, uh, you know, you, we look at these things, we, we're used to dealing with, with budget, with GCCs, with other levels of funding, and something that struck us, and again, I don't have a solution either, other than making uh, some clarification from behalf of the minister and her staff as to, you know, why they're proceeding in this, it almost seems like heavy-handed, uh, particularly when we a non-casino community doing the very best we can to compete with others uh, to have other sources of income. Anyway, I'll, I certainly uh, would like to hear a little bit more of what uh, Council might propose and also what we might do in uh, speaking with the Ministry again. Thank you. So I believe Councillor Woodward has an amendment. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to just uh, speak to the amendment a little bit first, so then when I read out the motion, it'll make more sense, Madam Chair. So um, right now, I'm going to be proposing an amendment to uh, add some land costs uh, for a unique situation that we have to complete the Tooth Wealth Connector uh, from 208th Street uh, through to the Williams Neighborhood Plan border. So uh, for council, will be aware of some of these issues but just to make everybody fully aware. So that road right now is a little unique. So from 208th at uh, 76 over and up, curving up to get up to 80th and 208th, portion of that road doesn't currently exist. Mm -hmm. And so it's a slightly unique situation versus a base road, which we're widening as part of the, the DCC program. So I'm gonna make and move that amendment now, if I may. All right. We can discuss that. Do we have a so seconder? I've actually just emailed it to uh, the clerk and I'll read it out. Uh, add $15 million to the miscellaneous road DCC account, increasing it from $10 million to $25 million to account for municipal land costs associated with the two-telf connector from 208th Street to the border of the Williams Neighborhood Plan. So move. Uh, seconded by Councillor Richter. Any discussion? Yeah, so I'll speak to that briefly. Okay. If I may. Yep. So that represents approximately a 3% increase on the current proposed, with the revised version is 562 million in roadworks. I'm adding approximately 15 million to that uh, for that road land cost for the road that doesn't exist currently, being a unique situation. And uh, I would ask potentially at this point for Mr. Sefi to clarify. Mr. Sefi, you have anything to add to the rationale for this and the acceptability of making this amendment to the current process? Mr. Uh, Steffi. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, uh, situation is unique in, in terms of uh, Councillor Woodward's uh, suggestion in that the road does not currently exist. Most, uh, I couldn't say for certain that, that it's all and 100%, but most, uh, the majority, great majority of the roads in the Willoughby area 
uh, do currently exist, uh, at least those that are in the DCC program. So those are major roads, either collector or arterial. Those currently exist in one f uh, shape or form and uh, require widening. Uh, the, the special situation in this case is that it does not exist. It, it is uh, envisioned and has been approved uh, as part of many processes, including our, our uh, neighbor plans and, and transportation plans to uh, provide additional uh, relief, if you will, to existing uh, arterial road network and provides uh, a arterial level of, of connectivity from the, uh, the new interchange at 216th to uh, the Willowbrook area. So with that in mind, there, aren't any, uh, there are not any complications by adding this to the program and uh, it provides uh, the ability for us to include that uh, and uh, it, it's part of the miscellaneous uh, item. Yes, I appreciate that clarification. I'll let others ask questions if they have any. I just have one more point to make to help Council in its decision here with this proposed amendment. Uh, with the removal of those other capital projects, uh, from the roads program, I calculated $35.6 million being removed by the province. And so now I'm proposing that we put back in approximately $15 million, not approximately $15 million, which is still a great net benefit to the development community. They're getting a a pretty good deal here with the province rejecting these additional assets into the DCC program. Uh, the rates that are in the report are going to go up a little bit, be submitted to the province, but still uh, much lower or lower than uh, the original bylaw that went through public consultation and industry consultation and was approved. So I hope that Council supports this logical amendment to include our and some other land costs for this unique situation into the program. All development in Willoughby will benefit from the provision of this road. Uh, so I look forward to having this as part of the DCC program um, to help facilitate its construction. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think it's something to certainly consider. I'm not sure if you're needing a friendly amendment or staff going to do it anyway. I was just wondering if staff, if I may through the chair, are going to continue... Uh, I'm not calling it an appeal or, or, or a clarification. I mean, this is something that has ha not happened before. And as to, you know, let them know also the ramifications of our community, if that indeed is the plan as well. Thank you. Madam Chair, so uh, staff's understanding is that council is actually uh, granting three readings with the amendment. Am I correct? Uh, is that what's been discussed? It is not an amendment and a referral, but rather amend, uh, adoption or rather granting of three readings with the amendment incorporated. That, Mr. Mr. Sevy, that would be my exact understanding, that we moved council, give first, second, third reading, and then I've made an amendment to add additional items to that first, second, and third reading. Thank you. So Thank with you. that clarification, if that was to pass, Madam Chair, then the, uh, uh, the next step would be to present the, the revised DCC bylaw to the province for approval and uh, subsequent to that we'll proceed with uh, discussions as i said at various levels uh, uh, including uh, political to uh, i guess try and and reason in terms of our, our historic approach and our understanding of the, uh, the local government act well you know so one, one other quick question is have you got wind of any other communities having these type of challenges if i mean i know we're kind of short notice but i was just wondering I mean, you might want to check that out as well abbotsford is the only one that we're aware of at this point thank you we'll just keep looking thank you councillor whitmarsh <laughs> sorry uh, yeah thanks i just want to make sure i understand uh what's happening um, so when I read the report, there was $47.6 uh, million dollars worth of projects that have been removed because they're not owned by the township. And Councillor Woodward, uh, your um, amendment is to add in 15 meter, or sorry, 15 million worth of, uh, for, of, of a project so that, um, which is in land that's township owned. Is that correct? And maybe just give me the location of that again. So I think I appreciate that chance to answer that, Madam Chair. So thank you. Yeah, so that would be the Willoughby, uh, sorry, the 212 connector from 208th Street uh, to the border of the Williams neighborhood plan, which Terra Farms development, if you remember that, that sort of curved and it heads up. But the, beyond that, the, the road exists. 
so we would be only talking about adding the land portion for the road that doesn't exist to distribute that that burden within the program um, for a project the 212 connector which is already in the dcc program for construction so it's a project already in the dcc program yep. we're just adding a land component a partial land component to add to that and that's the the curved sort of portion that's that the portion that doesn't exist so some right. of it is uh, east west but it's the portion that doesn't exist and i've clarified that uh, that with staff um, and that's estimated to be about 15 million that number was given to me by mr Sevi. okay thank you Okay, did we have a seconder on that? I don't believe we had. We did. I'll second Who was it. Okay. Councilor Richter seconded. Councilor Richter. Councilor Richter seconded it. Okay, so any more discussion? Councilor, hang on. Councilor Davis. Thank you. Um, so um, if we're going to put a road there, we are going to have to uh, spend a lot of money on it. But when you throw it, when you calculate 15 million, is that going to be enough, or is that um, uh, the question would be, is that enough? And also a question through the staff, um, how else, how were, were we going to build the road? Now, this is a new option, but maybe that may be... Um, Mr. Sefi? Uh, Madam Chair, I was trying to see if I could access a... Uh, aerial map of the area to to show the extent of what the uh, the mover has uh, has proposed uh, having said that in response to councillor davis's question uh, the uh, prior discussions that that staff have had with councillor woodward as was referenced uh, has resulted in a quick analysis and estimating of of the area affected and it's projected to be around uh, five acres, uh, which equates to about $15 million based on uh, on today's market condition. So that's how we've come up with the, with the $15 million. But that doesn't, that the cost of the road is not in there. The cost of the road has always been there for construction. What's being proposed to be added is the land value of it, which was previously anticipated to be acquired as part of the development process, but now uh, as part of the, the motion that's in front of council is being proposed to be added to the DCC program. Okay, thank you. Councillor Long. Yeah, so exactly where is we going to put this? I mean, uh, so the amendment that's been made and seconded can someone give me a roadmap here? Because there's a lot of documentation here. So where would that wording actually be put in in the, in the recommendation or in one of the tables? It'd be in the program, right? The program is being amended. It is. Uh, so if I can draw council's attention to page. Page G127, that is the, uh, the start of the uh, itemized list of DCC projects. Now, if you move over or keep going along that spreadsheet and move to page 30, you will see near the bottom there a line item that's line item 340. If I'm not mistaken, if my mm. eyes, miscellaneous which is road called DCC miscellaneous project. road DCCs, it currently has a, a number of ten million dollars. Oh, five. Approximately. So the intent is to add fifteen million dollars to that, for us to be able to include the the land component of the two twelfth street connector. You have to be standing on your head to read it on this one because the, the graph is sideways. Well, you don't have to. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Oh, Councillor Richter. You're... Oh, call the question. Sorry, I thought you wanted to talk. Okay, so I call the question on, on the amendment to uh, G1. passes unanimously. 
And now on the the bylaw as amended. One sec. Call the question. It passes unanimously. Okay, so moving on to bylaws for consideration at third reading, H1, rezoning application number 100597 and development permit application number 101139, Sun Life Assurance Company of Canada, incorporated 2009091A Avenue, bylaw number 5545. Do I have a and seconded, so moved by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Ferguson. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question on H1. It carries unanimously. Moving on to H2, 02031. 03, rezoning application number 100558 and development permit application number 101060, Narayan Prasad 198 68th Avenue, bylaw number 5543, bylaw number 5544. Uh, do I have a motion, please? Councillor Davis, Councillor Whitmarsh seconds. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, call the question on H2. Carries uh, with Councillor Arneson opposed. Uh, H3 0203104 rezoning application number 100521 and development permit application numbers 100997, 101156, and development variance permit number 100116. Waterstone Anderson 791198B Street and 7500 block of 198B Street. Bylaw number 5534. And bylaw number 5535, do I have a motion? Councillor Whitmarsh seconded. Councillor Ferguson, any discussion? Seeing none, call the question on H3. And it passes with uh, Councillor Richter and Councillor Arneson opposed. Moving on to H4, rezoning application number 100494, development permit application number 101140, and development variance permit application number 100114, Westmont Home, 76th Avenue, bylaw number 5540, bylaw number 5546. Do I have a motion? Councillor Long, seconded by Councillor Whitmarsh. Any discussion? Councillor Richter? Yeah, this um, <coughs> has come up a few times with regards to the location of a pocket park. And um, I'm wondering, I believe we've said somewhere along that until there will be, be no final reading until the pocket park is determined. But I'm wondering, because it's coming up over and over again for different properties in there, maybe we shouldn't be giving third readings on these until the pocket park is determined. And I'm just wondering through you to staff if that's possible. Mr. Backen? It certainly is possible, but it may have the adverse effect. If the documents, if the applications have third reading, there is some impetus for the development community to come together to solve the problem. At third, without third reading, there's no approval in principle. So I think they would be much more hesitant to try to advance their, their situation based on the fact that council hasn't endorsed the application. So it is a bit of a judgment call, but we, we feel that the best approach is to continue to uh, advance applications if they fit within the community plan and meet council's uh, concerns uh, with the clear proviso that final reading or, or final adoption cannot be provided until such time as we actually have uh, the pocket park issue resolved. Councillor Long. Yeah, well, as Mr. Lappin said, I think, I think that this is the way to get it moving, right? Everybody's sort of holding back until uh, something happens, so this is the only way it can, not the only way, but a very good way to get the issue resolved. And as has been said numerous times, there's no fourth reading going to happen until it is resolved, so hopefully this will, will make a move towards that by giving it a third reading. Okay, I don't see any other discussion. Um, I'm going to call the question on H4.
and it passes with Councillor Richter and Councillor Arneson opposed. So moving on to I, bylaws for consideration uh, at the third reading and for final adoption. Uh, zoning bylaw update dwelling unit definition bylaw number 5542. Uh, can I have a motion, please? Uh, Councillor Whitmarsh and seconded by Councillor Davis. Uh, any discussion? No. Nobody else. Okay. Call the question on. Oh, oh, there's nobody else. I thought you said something else. Okay, Councillor Woodward. Yeah, I, I, Mr. Beck, and I recall that when we gave this um, first and second that and went and, and authorized the public hearing that I requested some follow-up rationale. Uh, for the 90 square meters, uh, did I miss that in one of the distributions? Because I haven't seen I haven't seen any sort of rationale for for why the not the 90 not not a restriction is necessary, but why 90 versus another number. Uh, I don't recall the distribution item, but do you recall the conversation? Now that you reference it, uh, perhaps to deal with the matter, I can simply suggest that the 90 meter is simply a holdover from the BC Building Code. Uh, the rationale for that, uh, I don't think, was policy based. It was probably more size or limitation based. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think I was asking if I missed it. I mean, maybe it didn't, wasn't, it hasn't come forward yet. I, don't, if it may have been submitted to us, and I maybe I missed it. So I want to confirm that what we have in this report, which is the original report, there is no supplemental information. Uh, not at this point. Mr. Seppi? Just one other point, uh, perhaps that was not made previously, uh, Madam Chair, is that the, the Canadian National Code, uh, which I guess provides a bit more guidance, if you will, is actually 80 square meters for, uh, for secondary suites. So that's the number that the Government of Canada has uh, deemed to be appropriate for, for secondary suites, with uh, prov the, the ability for provinces to adopt their own codes, obviously. So it's an interesting clarification just for my own education. If the BC Building Code has no restriction, it doesn't default back to the Canadian Building Code. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, so um, I think, you know, for me, I kind of, you know, I kind of took a lot of the input. I've heard a lot on this one um, over the last, you know, before <clears throat> leading up to the public hearing from the people that I think know the real estate market uh, better than I do, uh, understanding what some of the market demands are, and really kind of wanted a rationale for, for why 90 meters, where I thought it was an interesting one where the status quo situation had 90 meters embedded in the BC Building Code. It's taken out, and it would be nice now for the, the status quo to come up with rationale, just like any reform-minded person has to come up with to change anything. So I, I would like to see some rationale for 90 meters. Why specifically 90 meters versus not some other alternatives? Uh, for example, 130 meters, which is 1,400 square feet, or 120 meters, which is 1,290, which a lot of people express to me is a more comfortable uh, secondary suite size for them, that they, they would live in a secondary suite with their family and provide child care, but they will not live in a, in a 900 square foot plus or minus uh, secondary suite, that it's too small for someone to downsize into, too uncomfortable, and they won't do it. So why not? What is wrong? I still don't understand what is wrong with a couple of extra two, three hundred, four hundred square feet um, as a maximum. If we want to set a maximum of some kind, while we wait for the outcome of the of the assessment that was approved in the afternoon meeting, would it be more appropriate to allow some flexibility with a larger number, uh, given that I would be providing the same rationale that's been provided for ninety? Mr. Baggin. I'm sure that would uh, be logical. What I was going to conclude was that the the number that we're using at this point, well, um, historical from the BC Building Code, is a transitional number until we actually complete the study that was referenced earlier in the day. That will give us a new number. In the interim, without a number, there is an unlimited size. Uh, so if Council feels there is a more appropriate interim number, uh, given the feedback, public consultation, input that uh, has been referenced, it's quite appropriate to specify that at this time with an amendment. <coughs> and again, keeping in mind this is interim until such time as we finish that study. Yeah, so to clarify my position before I make some suggestions, um, you know, I do support some kind of a limit. So, you know, do we want 1,800 or 2,000 square feet secondary suites? I think that would need to be evaluated by staff more fully before that. But maybe, you know, from what we've heard, I still don't see a problem with 
allowing a more comfortable two bed plus den, which is around 12, 1300 square feet. So 1345 square feet would be 125 square meters. And so I'll let others speak first, but Madam Chair, I would, I would either refer this back, which delays having some kind of a restriction, which I don't necessarily, I agree that we need to put in something while we come up with a longer term number, um, but would like to, to, to consider an amendment to a larger number. Thank you. Councillor Long. Well, then we're going to muck around with numbers. I guess we're picking numbers out of the hat, which was mentioned earlier. And if we're going to change it anyway, based upon potentially what the uh, housing st study shows us, then I, I don't know if it's wise to make a couple of, you know, you'd be changing it two or three times, right? Um, now, my concern here, first of all, I live in, my wife and I live in 90, 90 square meters, and we're pretty happy. Um, we had a cat, too, for a while. But the thing is, if, if you just pick a number today, then, then what's the point of actually having this housing uh, assessment study done? Then you're going to change it a second time. But the fact that the uh, province has removed the restriction allows some flexibility, and I'm wondering why we would even pick a number when we could, we could actually have the proponent who makes an application for a suite give some rationale as to whatever size suite they want to build. Because currently, I think you have to have an application for a second dwelling. So wouldn't the application process ask that kind of a question and then you could look at parking you could look at uh, you know all kinds of aspects of, of the location of that secondary suite to make sure it's, it's going to fit in the neighborhood and I don't think you're going to find one size fits all that's for sure and that's why there's this move to a smaller size as a base point is probably quite wise and it has been in our history to have that but let me ask also here or, or for sure if somebody wanted to build a suite larger, now that there is no BC building code restriction, and even though this bylaw sets a, well, not a base, but it sets a size based on our historical uh, um, records, could they, could they not apply for a larger one? Is there a variance uh, process that someone could apply for and say, well, look, you know what, I've got a big lot, I've got lots of parking, I've got a big family that wants to move in, and uh, I'm going to propose 1,200 square feet. Um, what do you say? And then I guess... We would also have to, in all fairness, attach some kind of a price for that license because uh, I suppose if it's a larger suite, you're going to have more people living there, which means they're using more services, and, and I think it would only be fair to all the taxpayers if, there's a, if they pay their share. But I guess the main question I'm asking, is it possible to get a variance? And if not, could we put that in, which means you wouldn't have to worry about it right now. Mr. Sabi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, there is a, a provision for, for anyone to seek Council's approval for an amendment or a variance to any of our bylaws. So that could happen between now and the review as well. So in other words, if we leave it the way it is it, it, and somebody wants to build a larger suite, away they go. Uh, Mr. Steffi, perhaps you could elaborate on the process, though, because I, I think um, it's certainly true there is such a process, but much of that process, I think, could be beyond... Uh, our time controls or our, or our, our council's controls. So can you elaborate on the process to get a variance? Well, assuming a, uh, a bylaw of some, some level is passed tonight uh, and somebody comes forward with a proposal to amend that uh, with a larger footprint that would uh, require an amendment or a variance of our bylaw that would be presented to council as part of a development variance process. Uh, I guess it de depends on, yeah. on the actual specifics, but it could be uh, three months. Oh, I see where you're going. Six months. This, yeah, because this, it would be uh, timely and it would be expensive. So we would want to put a process that was neither of those. It could be perhaps executed by staff. There would be certain conditions that have to be met in order for an expansion of the uh, suite to be done. I mean, could that not be formulated to avoid where you're going with this, Mr. Markham, which is a, another another thing that we have to pass. Not that I mind. That's what we're here for. But maybe <coughs> it could be an automated process or something that can be put into practice that would require uh, staff to approve it. It's always good to examine alternatives, but uh, the challenge then as we go to the next level is if it's to be a process to be administered by, administered by staff, it would need a delegation of authority, likely by bylaw, to actually achieve that. So again, we, 
we add further time to it. Um, it it's a challenging one because of, of uh, our commitment to deal with the, uh, the size later on this year. We're really looking at the interim measurement in terms of what's going to be most appropriate. Uh, some communities would say uh, no limit. Uh, we have a bit of concern about that because it, uh, it could create something that is highly uh, contextually incompatible with the area and our, our subsequent processes. Um, and I, I guess I would defer back to council then if we're to look at an interim measurement or interim size um, I think it's really uh, the most uh, the, the wisest approach is going to be for council to reflect on the submissions they've heard the communications they've had and to use something on this interim basis because hopefully it's about a, a six to eight month period of time uh, before we get the study back and we can embark upon the bylaw process or the alternative is simply to leave it at the 900 until we do have that back 900 square feet it, it really depends upon what uh, what direction council wants because again these limitations were originally set with a certain degree of arbitrariness and perhaps at a time well before we see the current uh, housing uh, challenges we're facing uh, with families uh, uh, effectively banding together now because of the, the uh, dynamics of the real estate market. Well I still hold to my theory here that if we don't somehow regulate this and we change the number arbitrarily which is what I'm hearing you're going to have other problems because you're going to have neighbors neighborhoods complaining perhaps on the suite being too large maybe not enough parking and all, all other kinds of services required for that suite and uh, we're opening up a whole new problem. So I, I, I think we should actually put a process in place that allows for a fairly easy uh, and a time sensitive process by which they can uh, uh, increase the size of their suite if given enough rationale. That's my thoughts on it. And I don't think we should be changing it now at least. Let's wait the six or seven months. Councillor Whitmarsh. Yeah, that's uh, helpful uh, to understand. It's about s roughly six months until uh, we have a response with the uh, housing needs assessment. And uh, so for me, I, I certainly appreciate that we'd like to go bigger. I think that makes sense uh, to allow larger than 90 square meters. Um, but I'm not uh, at this point probably not in favor of just picking a number. And then in six months, we'll readjust the number. So people that got in within that six months have a different number than the other people that are after that. Um, it just seems an awkward uh, way to do business. And so I, I'd, I'd probably prefer we stay with the 90 square meters, uh, get the BC housing, or the, sorry, BC housing needs assessment done as quickly as possible, and then we'll have the number there, and that'll be the number that we move forward with, and uh, that makes sense to me. So I'd uh, stick with what we have. Just to interject, Mr. Seffi, the timeline for the housing needs assessment, the response, and then the time to put the bending bylaw in place? Uh, the housing needs assessment is currently underway and is expected to be brought forward to council uh, by late summer, early fall of this year. Uh, but just, I guess, uh, staff wasn't provided an opportunity to, to provide any comment this afternoon uh, when the subject came up. Uh, the housing needs assessment is actually by its nature, even though it can provide what councils ask staff to do, it can certainly do that. Uh, it was intended to, to identify gaps. So its, its mandate was not to provide specific recommendations in specific areas, but rather how do we address some areas uh, with respect to our housing needs. And, and it was always intended to be followed up with, and it still is, with a more specific action plan. That action plan will follow the findings of the assessment. The housing needs assessment uh, is expected this year. The housing action plan will follow next year. Uh, staff recommendation would have been uh, to make that part of the housing action plan to be delivered next year, but certainly we will we will work make sure that it's done this year. And as part of, I guess, uh, or as far as a subsequent bylaw might be concerned, that will depend on council's direction. It could be done uh, fairly quickly within uh, three to four months of the housing needs assessment. All right, um, Councillor Richter, uh, Whitmer, Councillor Whitmer, are you still I'm, I'm on finished. this? Yeah, okay, Councillor Richter. Um, yeah, in terms of increasing it, I could maybe live with 1,200 square feet as opposed to the 900 square feet, but I'm certainly not prepared at this point to look at anything over 1,200. Um, I, I think we should wait for the uh, the response, but if Councillor 
Woodward wants to move it up to 120 meters squared. I'd be willing to second that and see what happens with it. Councillor Woodward. Yeah, so I will. I appreciate that, uh, that assistant on where some people stand. Um, so I'd like to move that amendment, Madam Chair. Okay. And we have a secondary? Okay. Yep, the number you gave. Yep. Okay, so it's um, seconded by Councillor Richter. Any discussion on the... To to okay. So I'll carry on speaking to that. So I'll address some of the points that have been raised. I mean, I'm always amazed that uh, had people claim to support private property rights and then find ways to restrict them. I mean, uh, you know, I, I view this as a simple, basic private property rights issue that if, unless you can demonstrate some harm that's being done with a, with a larger secondary suite, I don't see the problem. Uh, so in terms of just picking a number, um, picking 90 is just picking a number. There's been no rationale for 90 other than that's what we've always had and what we've always done. Uh, you know, that's some other points. I'm not going to repeat all the submissions that came in at the public hearing uh, in regards to a lot of people looking for this, wanting slightly larger secondary suites where it doesn't increase the size of the structure. You have a box that you're allowed to build and you make a little bit slightly small distribution to a secondary suite inside that box to make more people want to live in secondary suites. Um, you know, this is, you know, lots of issues in, in, uh, around our bylaws that I see. And, for example, if we're not, if we're restricting the size of secondary suites, why aren't we restricting the size of apartments? I don't see much of a difference between an apartment and a secondary suite, um, yet we don't, no one's proposing we restrict the size of apartments. And in terms of parking, for example, I, didn't, I won't belabor this all night, but one more example. Um, you can build a seven-square, seven-bedroom apartment in the township and your parking requirements for that are 1.5 stalls. Um, so again, this is not, there's, there's lots of incompatibilities and lots of rationale we can all come up with to oppose anything we want to oppose. Um, but I'm not hearing any real rationale. And what I'm also hearing is we're going to be a long time away for the completion of that, at least what I consider to be, uh, building assessment and then, you know, the time after that to uh, repeat a bylaw. So I really hope that we can take a slightly larger size in the interim and allow some people in the market to determine the size of their suites uh, up to that maximum, which I can live with for now until that process completes. But I'd find it pretty, pretty disappointing if we don't allow people to, to take their houses and for secondary suites for grandma and their parents who don't want to live in a shoebox. Thanks. Councillor Long. <clears throat> well, uh, I think uh, over the years we've heard plenty of concerns from folks in the neighbourhood with secondary suites, and of course I support them. We do need uh, alternate alternative housing options for people. We do need to uh, address the housing shortages, but there are ramifications that come with it. So picking a size out of the hat like we're doing here, well, that is in that's going to increase the, 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 uh, the demand for parking. It's going to increase the demand for services for that particular residence. So uh, I don't think it's a matter of opposing everything by any, by no means. I, I'm not opposing anything in that respect, but I don't know if it's a wise thing just to take, take a number and move it up to 12, well, if it's 1,200 square feet, let's make that one. I suppose that's an extra bedroom or two, so that there is a rationale there. But there is a rationale for the number that's in here, and it is, it's the number that we've been using for many, many years, so I don't think it comes out of nowhere. Um, but I, I, I still basically agree with what's being said here, but I like the process of an application that would allow you to, to do a larger suite, and then we can make sure that we that the, the, the proponent has enough um, parking and enough other things that are required to house more people. If you put more people in the suite, you're going to have more cars. You have more cars, you're going to have some problems in the neighborhood. Um, I wish we could find a solution that would, uh, that would work, and I think what I suggested would be one. But I'm not trying to oppose things just because I'm, a, you know, just for no reason. I think there will be a lot of backlash or a lot of concerns coming from larger suites that don't have the proper planning around them. Um, I'm just going to comment on that. I'm going to support the amendment just because I know that's what we're moving in that direction. So I can't see um, it's going to go down that much. So I will be supporting the amendment. Um, Councillor Ferguson. I think that we've gone around in a circle quite a bit here. This afternoon we talked about um, what we could do to get information from staff after a housing strategy. That's been discussed. The mover um, also made a suggestion which is also a good suggestion i think let's move ahead with su with the suggestion support it and then it's also wait which is going to be coming anyway for information regarding housing needs assessment so 
it all makes sense. I don't know why there's been a lot of discussion on this, uh, but uh, it's time to move and time to vote, perhaps. Councillor Whitmarsh. Uh, yeah, I've heard um, two numbers. I heard 120 square meters and I heard 1,200 square feet. So I'm just wondering which one is in the motion because they're, they're different. It's 120 square meters currently. That's Councillor Richter suggested. It is 120 square meters is the motion, so that's about 1,300 square feet. 1,291. 1,291, yep. 1,291. So is that what that's you fine. intend? I'm okay with that. Okay. Okay, okay Councillor Councillor Woodward. Yeah, so I, I mean, I... I'm not gonna. I don't want to talk about this all night either. But I just can't. I just can't let this go by. I mean, you know, the the same comments were stated that we're just picking numbers out of the air here, and we hear this a lot. Um, where again, we're not just picking numbers out of the air. I expect he spent quite a bit of time trying to rationalize it. Um, um, you know, where we're just it's just stated as fact that this is going to increase the parking problem. When I outlined that it doesn't increase the size of the structure, it just changes the flexibility for people to give a little bit more space to a secondary suite occupant to allow for people that have communicated through the real estate industry that they want some of this flexibility and they will live in a slightly larger basement suite with the same number of cars and so on. And then again, I don't see any effort to restrict seven bedroom apartments uh, with one bedroom with one and a half stalls and all these other things that, that are potentially contributing to our parking problems uh, that are in occurring in some of our communities. And again, basic, basic private property rights. Thank you. Councillor Long. Find a seven seven bedroom apartment, but if it does exist, then the issue of parking is within that complex. It's not a township's problem. It's not going to be on our streets. Well, it might go on our streets, but it, apartment parking is contained within the development. So, if somebody wants to have a seven bedroom apartment, which I don't know where it exists, perhaps in Fort Langley somewhere, then they're going to have to figure out how they're going to how they're going to park their cars, and that's going to be their concern. Um, anyway, we don't want to belabor it, but that, that answers that one about the parking. But I think if you add more people in a suite, there's going to be more cars. It's just, we just can't get around that. So anyway, let's vote. Okay, so let's not belabor, and I'm going to call the vote. Okay, I won on the amendment. And it passes with Councillor Longpost. Okay, uh, uh, moving on. Ooh, wow. Main motion. Oh, the main motion. Okay. Um, calling uh, the question on the main, the main motion. Sorry, I won. And it passes unanimously as well. All right. So, moving on to, um, I believe the mayor's report. It's kind of weird that I'm doing the mayor's report, but um, here we are. Good evening, everybody. Uh, there is a few events to report on this week uh, that were attended to by myself as acting mayor along with other members of council. On Tuesday, January 21, the Greater Lang Langley Chamber of Commerce held its monthly dinner meeting and councillors Ferguson, Arneson, uh, Whitmarsh and I were in attendance and we had a very robust discussion about um, cannabis retail. So. Uh, curling, uh, curling fans had an opportunity to see the best young curlers in the country in action uh, last week when the 2020 New Holland Canadian Junior Curling Championships were held at the George Preston Recreation Centre. I was pleased to attend the opening ceremonies on Saturday, January uh, 18, as well as a banquet on Friday. January 24 uh, brought greetings from the township. Manitoba, Manitoba emerged victorious with teams winning in both the junior men's and junior women's categories. They will now go on to represent Canada at the 2020 World Junior Championships in Russia next month. Congratulations to the winners and everyone who participated. <clears throat> On a sad note, on Friday, January 24, a celebration of life was held for uh, Debbie Froze, wife of Mayor Jack Froze, who passed away earlier this month after a battle with cancer. The ceremony was held at Christian Life Assembly and was very well attended. It was a lovely remembrance of Debbie and a tribute to a life well lived. Debbie was a wife, mother, grandmother, businesswoman, volunteer, and a huge supporter of our community, and she will be greatly missed. Our condol condolences go out to the, the Froze family. A couple of upcoming events, uh, January 29, the UDI's Mayor Panel um, and Municipal Expo 2020 at the Langley Event Center. February 1, uh, we have the exhibit opening reception, The Sporting Life at the Langley Centennial Museum. 
Uh, we also have a couple of Metro Translink meetings. Um, and do we have any um, reports from our Metro uh, attendants? No? Okay. Councillor Arneson says no. Councillor Ferguson says yes. With waste this week and we uh, <coughs> last week and we are proceeding with uh, um, improvements to the, a number of the metro sewage treatment plants as well as uh, it's important to note that the public when they're flushing put not the flush rags or, or unflushables down the toilet because it wrecks the facility and in the future it costs our system and taxpayers money so always be aware we have a campaign for that. It's an important campaign. Also, uh, on treaty negotiations, I said as a Metro rep for um, KC Treaty, and we're pre pre uh, proceeding accordingly into the next stage, and uh, we'll be happy to note when the time comes that uh, another treaty will be accepted into the province, and it's really, really good news and proceeding accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, um, any other business? Okay. Oh, Councillor Ferguson? Oh, other than I was attended the mayor of the city of Langley, she had a gala and uh, they're ra uh, last week on Saturday, and they're raising money for the Langley Memorial Hospital, which is a good cause. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I need a motion to terminate. Termination. Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Whitmarsh. Are all in favor? All right. So we'll have a few minutes before we have the public hearing. Five minutes. <laughs> 